to um, announce the winner of the Waddington Medal tonight. And as you know, it's the most prestigious award um, given by the BSDB, and it's named after Conrad Waddington, who was a very preeminent and distinguished geneticist and embryologist whose research career spanned the 1930s to the 1950s. And in addition, he was a very accomplished paleontologist, and the Wedding Waddington Medal, which was designed by the late Rosa Beddington, shows his very favorite animal, the ammonite, whose uh, shell displays the entire life history of the animal. And on the reverse side of the medal, there's a picture of a snake eating its own tail to symbolize feedback control with this very lovely Greek inscription on the bottom. So um, the medal's given for outstanding contributions, really, to developmental biology. And it's always a great personal pleasure for me to introduce the winner of the medal, the 2014 medal prize. And so here is our medal winner at the age of nine months, looking absolutely beautific. I think he's about nine months old. And he grew up into this very lively looking little lad with a beautifully captivating smile. And many decades later, he's retained the same smile. And it's the undistinguishable <laughs> image of uh, Phil Ingham. So Phil's being recognized for his truly um, seminal and remarkable contributions to our understanding of the genetic basis of uh, fly embryo patterning, as well, of course, as his deciphering of the components of the all-important hedgehog signaling pathway. And we're really looking forward to hearing um, Phil's lecture, which is going to cover his entire research career when he gets onto the podium. But first, as is traditional, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of background information about tonight's speaker. So Phil's family hails from Lancashire. Um, he was born and brought up in um, Bootle, which is on the, the periphery of, of, of Liverpool. His dad was an accountant, and his grandfather had a dairy. Uh, Phil's middle name is William, and I believe... Whoops, sorry, wrong, wrong pointer. And I believe, and hope Phil can correct me if I'm wrong, that he was named after his grandfather, who thankfully survived World War I, where he fought in some of the most horrendous battles of the, of the Great War. Um, I've also been sent several pictures of, of uh, Phil wearing a kilt. So I'm assuming that somewhere in his background there are some Scottish jeans. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Phil just likes wearing skirts. We'll see. <laughs> so growing up in Merseyside in the 60s, when the Beatles were at their kind of the height of their fame, had a very important influence on Phil. And he spent uh, many summers as a teenager working on his cousin's farm. And he saved all his wages up and used the money to go and buy tickets for concerts at the Liverpool University Students' Union. And um, unfortunately, I don't think he actually saw the kind of Fab Four in person, but he also did manage to see very many famous bands. And it kind of inspired him to um, take up the guitar and set up his own band, which was called Zug, by all accounts. And um, I don't think he ever made it onto the stage himself because he was strongly advised by his um, school teachers to kind of forget all his aspirations to be a boy band, but rather focus on his O-levels but I gather that Phil can on occasion be persuaded to pick up the guitar, and you never know. We've had previous Waddington medal winners who actually played for us on stage, so we'll see if, if Phil has any, any of those treats up his sleeve. So Phil also went up to Christ's College in Cambridge, where he um, studied social and political science. He read theology as a part 1A, but then switched to natural sciences, where he particularly um, was engrossed by the genetics courses, and by now, hooked on science, he went to Bob Whittle's lab in Sussex for his PhD work, where he studied the homeotic gene trithorax. After a brief spell in Pat Simpson's lab in Strasbourg, he returned to a postdoctoral position with David Ishorvitz at the ISRF at Mill Hill, where he set about cloning segmentation genes. So I asked David what he could tell me about Phil as a scientist. And he commented that while Phil's contributions to the molecular characterization of the hedgehog signaling pathway were arguably his, his best-known contribution, he thought more significant were the pioneering genetic experiments using largely this beautiful technique of, of in-situ hybridization that allowed him to define the pathway well in advance of any molecular studies, and it was a tour de force in genetic logic. And hopefully, I think Phil's going to tell, about us, tell us about us in the talk this, afternoon, this evening. So after a hugely um, successful postdoc, 
Phil eventually joined the newly established ICRF Developmental Biology Unit in Oxford, where he set about working on um, wingless and engrailed, and then went on to clone the membrane protein patched and the secreted molecule with which it interacts, which is, of course, hedgehog. He stayed there for about eight or nine years, doing all this beautiful work, and Paul Martin, who was a colleague of his at the time, said he really was a truly inspirational scientist for the young postdocs and students at the DBU, leading by example, often working endless hours late into the night. But luckily, um, he did manage to spend some time first uh, courting and then marrying his lovely wife-to-be, Anita. And here they are on the DBU football team. This is Anita here, and here's Phil. And I think we might just hear a little bit more about their exploits on the football field during his lecture. But it was also during his time in Oxford that uh, Phil first became acquainted with zebrafish embryos. Um, and he was introduced to the zebrafish by one of his scientific heroes, Yanni nussein volhart who was just setting up a major fish screen in her lab in Tübingen. And, and Phil visited and came away with the kind of expectation that one could really do exciting stuff in vertebrate development and that maybe the zebrafish was the perfect genetic system for starting to study these interesting problems. And I believe, and again, Phil may correct me, but he was probably the first scientist in the UK to start working on zebrafish. And even at the DBU, um, he had several tanks of, of fish squirreled away in the corners of his lab. In uh, 1996, he was eventually recruited away from the ICRF um, up to Sheffield to head up a program in developmental genetics that later morphed into the very successful MRC Center for Developmental and Biomedical Science that Phil directed from 2005 to 2009. But in 2005, he went on a sabbatical as a visiting um, professor at the University of Singapore with his family. And unfortunately for UK science, he and the family enjoyed it so much that they've made Singapore their, their home at present. And Phil is now professor and vice dean for research at the Lee Kong Chang School of Medicine, which is a joint venture between Imperial here in London and Nanying Technical University. So hopefully I've probably given you the impression that Phil's a terribly hard-working, science-obsessed individual, but he does have lots of other interests outside the lab. He's traveled the world extensively with his wife, Anita, and the three children. He enjoys high-risk sports, as we hear, skiing without a helmet. He also apparently enjoys flying, this time with a helmet, or what good a helmet will do if you drop several hundred feet <laughs> into the, onto the terrain below. Um, he's also got some lower risk activities, including sailing. And um, since moving to tr the tropical climes, he's taken up a whole new sport, which is referred to as jungle biking. <laughs> as you see, it's obviously very, very an interesting, an interesting activity to have adopted. And he's also um, very frequently to be seen on the tennis courts at the Singapore British Club, where, according to Anita, he's perfected slow motion tennis. But he takes all of this terribly seriously. I should also mention that he's a lifelong fan and follower of Liverpool Football um, Club and um, follows, I'm sure, from a distance, the activities of the Premier League very, very, very seriously. But I've also taken my job seriously, and I took the time to look to see what happened over the weekend. And I gather that um, Liverpool thrashed um, Manchester United yesterday afternoon while you were all in the Graduate Student Symposium. So I'm sure Phil was very pleased about that, especially as... Chelsea lost 1-0 to um, Aston Villa. <laughs> and now this puts Liverpool, as you know, within four points of Chelsea with one game in hand. And I have to say that I'm not a football fan, but I have noticed that Liverpool does manage to score rather more goals than Chelsea. So I'm sure that, um, that, that that's very, very gratifying for Phil. But very finally, um, I just wanted to mention that part of the medal is also contribution to UK developmental biology. And of course, Phil um, has fulfilled this um, in very many ways. He's also served on the BSDB committee back in the 1980s through to the 1990s. He chaired the society from 99 to 2004, during which time he established the Beddington Medal in memory of Rosa, who was a very dear friend of Phil's, dating back to the time they spent together working in Oxford. Over the course of his career, he's received very many um, accolades and awards including membership of the Royal Society in 2002. And in 2005, he was given the medal of the UK Genetics Society. He's on a multitude of boards and panels around the world. Um, he has a truly horrible, terrible carbon footprint. 
But however, none nonetheless, we're delighted that he could come today. He's just been elected the president of the International Society for Developmental Biology, and hopefully you're all going to save up and make the trip to his meeting, which he's going to organise in Singapore in 2017. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Phil to come up to the stage to collect his medal and give his lecture. Right. So as if by magic, we're going now going to put you up on screen, I think. Great. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Liz. It's, um, it's really overwhelming, actually, to be given this award. Um, I, I, as, as Liz said, I was, I was chairman for five years, so I, I did this on an annual basis. So to be on the other end, on the receiving end, is, is, is particularly exciting for me. Um, I was very flattered by the introduction that she gave, and um, I'm particularly impressed by your grasp of the premiership. <laughs> that was outstanding. And, of course, it was a particular thrill to be able to um, get here in time to watch. I actually was able to watch the match live in the Students' Union before the, before the, the uh, symposium yesterday. So, I realise we're running late. It's already 8.30 and you want to get to the bar, so I'll try to be, be succinct. Um, and I thought I'd begin, actually, just by um, reminding myself and, and, and the audience that, that, the fir that I was actually elect first elected or first appointed to the, the committee of the BSDB in 1987, and I co-organized, helped co-organize uh, my first meeting the following year, which was on segmentation in Bristol, 1988, 26 years ago, which is quite shocking. And uh, these were the participants, and it, it, just, it just occurred to me that it was quite an august um, assembly of speakers because two of them went on to get the Nobel Prize, Yanni nusslan volhard and Eric Wieshaus, and also several, five of them, have gone on to, to collect the, the Waddington Medal. And of course, I can now add myself to this, <laughs> <laughs> which is rather nice. I mean, I must say, at this time, I did actually speak at quite a lot of BSD me meetings, and in fact, I'm... I'm I think, um, I seem to remember Daniel St. Johnston complaining once that I was, I, Jim Smith and I seem to speak at every BSDB meeting. So I would point out, Daniel, that this is the first time I've sp spoken at one of these meetings this century. <laughs> and actually everything I talk about will be from last century. <laughs> so, so as Liz said, um, just a a couple of months ago, actually, I became vice dean of this exciting new medical school in Singapore, which is a joint venture between Imperial College London and Nanyang Technological University. These are our new buildings. Uh, they, they just started work on these last month. We'll be moving into this one next August. And this one is 20 stories, so it's going to take a little longer. That won't be ready till 2016. Uh, but it's impressive the speed at which things go in Singapore. So, you know, there have been a few raised eyebrows, actually, be me, be me becoming vice dean for research at a medical school, and someone said, you know, how can somebody who works on zebrafish be the vice dean of a medical school? And I said, well, you know, actually, I don't really see myself as a fish biologist. I'm really a, a Drosophila geneticist. <laughs> <laughs> and, but there is a serious point there, because I think development, you know, I don't need to tell this audience that developmental biology has contributed hugely to biomedical science over the last 30 years, and I think it will continue uh, to contribute uh, greatly over the next 20 years. And really, that's the, so the sort of theme of my talk tonight is going to be the importance of doing basic research, which again, I think, is a message that we all have to keep on reinforcing in ourselves, because basic research is essential, and basic research can lead to important uh, medical discoveries. It can, it can lead to new therapies. So that's one message. The other message is that science goes in, certainly in my experience, in completely random directions, and a lot of it is serendipity, luck, and chance. So I hope I'll in, I'm going to try and illustrate those two principles in my, my talk this evening. So to start at the beginning, this was uh, the class two, uh, the, the part two genetics class in 1977. And this was my introduction to biology, really, because, as Liz said, I started out reading theology and, and social and political science and only switched 
to genetics in my final year. And I, only, I sort of switched to genetics by default because I told my director of studies that I'd like to ch switch to science. And he said, well, he looked at my background. So the only, I said I wanted to do biological science. He said, well, the only, the only biological science you could possibly do is genetics. And that really isn't, it's really a branch of mathematics. Um, they're not really biologists. And that was, and that was certainly the, the, you know, that was not an uncommon view of genetics in the 1970s, and it was something which followed me when I went on to do my PhD. And um, I must say, I came to do my PhD, uh, first, this is the first accident, um, because I was in a, in a cytology class, a cytogenetics class one afternoon in the genetics department, and we did, end, we seemed to do endless chromosome fraps, and I was getting really bored of this, and at, at some point I looked and saw three or four of my fellow students sneaking out of the door. So I decided to follow them, imagining they were going to go off to the pub or something. When we got outside, they said, right, we have to get to the anatomy department. And they were going to the Natural History Society. So too embarrassed to admit that I was just going to sag off, I joined them. And, um, and I heard this most amazing talk by this person, Peter Lawrence. And, and, and Peter, in the, I think subsequently Peter has actually given lectures, but in those days he didn't give lectures to undergraduates, so, so this was the only way I would have encountered him. And so this one, this one hour talk which he gave about compartments and, and the, role, the, the possible role of engrailed in specifying compartments just completely transfixed me. And from that moment on I decided I wanted to study Drosophila development. So an incredible um, piece of chance. So I... I I talked to my, um, one of my senior lecturers and mentors, Mike Ashburner, about where to go, and he suggested a few people, um, because Peter already had, Peter only liked to take one graduate student at a time, and he had Gary Struhl working with him then, so I knew there's no point approaching Peter. And, and Mike suggested one of his old buddies from Cambridge, uh, Robert Whittle, who was now uh, a, a lecturer at Sussex University. <coughs> so I went down to see Robert, very nice man, he only died a few years ago. And, um, and Robert at that time was working on wing patterning actually, and so he told me all about this bizarre uh, mutant that he was working on called Costal 2. It was actually an interaction between two lethal mutations. So if you made a double heterozygote, you would get these wings at, um, at sort of low penetrant, low frequency. And, um, and it was this interaction that, 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 um, which uh, I remember Peter Lawrence rather unkindly referring to as the Whittle effect. You put two mutants together and get a mess, was, <laughs> was what Peter said. And I, I sort of tended to agree with him. I thought it was totally untractable. So I'd, I'd, but, but Robert offered me the PhD position. But in those days, really, you could be offered a PhD and you could then just go and do whatever you wanted because people didn't, you know, PIs didn't have to raise huge amounts of money and justify having students and postdocs and so forth. So that he, got a, he got a studentship allocated to him, and he said, I could do what I wanted. So I turned up at Sussex, and I, I um, met for the first time this gentleman, Jimmy Sang, who was the head of, 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 the, develop, of the developmental genetics group in Sussex. And actually, Robert had been Jimmy's postdoc before he'd become... Um, a, a, a lecture in his own right. And interestingly, Jimmy was himself a, a, a student of, of Conrad Waddington, so that's my connection to, to the Waddington uh, medal, I suppose. Um, and Jimmy was a, was, a, was a great man, very influential, had very strong views, and really ran this genetics group um, you know, like a very tight ship, actually. And, and we were really quite... I think we were, we were quite uh, isolated from the rest of the School of Biological Sciences. And, and as I said before, as geneticists, we were viewed with, with some suspicion. And I think that was sort of a, a, a throwback to the, 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 the days of, which were at that time, not all that long ago, of, of, of the eugenics movement, actually. And genetics still had rather a bad name. But, but, but Jimmy, you know, far from being close to the eugenics movement, he was, he was a, a lifelong socialist. And a, and, and a man of great integrity and great conscience, and also very inspiring. So, so between Jimmy and Robert, I was, in, you know, I was in a fantastic place, actually, to do what I wanted to do. So three giants of Drosophila genetics shown here, Thomas Hunt Morgan, Howard Sturtevant, and E.B. Lewis. Sturtevant was Morgan's student. E.B. Lewis was Sturtevant's student. And it's sobering to think that it's just 100 years ago since Morgan and Sturtevant 
uh, made the first linkage map. They mapped, I think, three genes on the X chromosome, to, which showed that genes were actually uh, located on chromosomes. And in many ways, I feel much more part of this generation than I do of, of the generation sitting in front of me now, because uh, Ed Lewis I, I came to know very well. And, and it's important to, to, to remember that at this time, so this, I'm talking about the 90, late 1970s when I started my PhD, this was before any, any molecular biology was being done, certainly in eukaryotes. So there were no genes sequenced, there were no genes cloned, actually. We really didn't know anything. We just knew phenotypes. And there was this big red book, which some of the Drosophilus here may still know about, called Lindsley and Grell. And you could take Lindsley and Grell and just thumb through it and find interesting looking mutations. And then you could order them from Ed Lewis, actually. There was a stock center in, in Caltech. And they would come in little, little cardboard tubes. And Ed would sometimes write some notes about them. I mean, Ed was amazing because he didn't publish very much, as many as you may know. I think when he won the Nobel Prize, he'd only published about 25 papers in the last 30 or 40 years. And um, he, he, but he was very generous in telling certainly in, 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 in telling me about his unpublished work and used to write very long letters, which uh, regrettably I threw away when I, when I finished my PhD. Um, anyway, of course, as you all know, Ed was famous for his analysis of the, the bithorax locus, and it was this, uh, it was <coughs> the, the, the notion of, of homeotic genes which was specifying the identity of segments which I was really became interested in. And so I had a very naive idea, which was that there must be something, um, there, must be, there must be some way of activating homeotic genes. This, mo this model of, of genes which are expressed along the AP axis there must be something which activates them during embryogenesis. So my idea was that I set out to find maternal effect mutations uh, which would affect, which would cause homeotic transformations. Completely naive, and it was it probably wouldn't have worked. So, but I started doing a big EN, ENU, sorry, EMS mutagenesis. I probably generated about two and a half thousand lines on the second chromosome. But whilst I was doing that, because um, that took a few months to actually generate all those mutants and those lines, I was just playing around crossing various mutants which I'd found in Lindsay and Grell together. And uh, one day, these flies popped up. The six-winged fly which um, I therefore called trithorax, because bithorax has four wings, so trithorax has six wings. Actually, this is the only fly I ever found like this which had six wings, so normally the, the best you could get was five, but uh, it shows that it is possible. And um, so I thought this was very exciting. And of course, you know, based on Robert's genetic interactions giving unusual, I mean, crosses between different mutants giving unusual phenotypes. I assumed that this phenotype had arisen because I'd crossed these two stocks together. So I took all of the mutants and put them in ethanol, all of these transformed flies, which is what you do you pr to preserve them so that I could make preparations of them the next day. And then Robert came in the next day and I told him about it. And he said, well, let's see the flies. So I got out this little jar of, of pickled flies. <laughs> and Robert's face was... <laughs> so we then, I then spent an hour or so sorting through the big bin of discarded fly tubes, trying to find the tube that um, this, cro this cross had been made in, and actually found it and, and recovered this mutant. And this became the subject of my PhD, in fact. So this is... Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was a close call. <laughs> so this was an interesting mutant because it, was, it had all of the characteristics that I was looking for, that I was setting out to find in my screen. But it's caused uh, homeotic transformations, um, not just of one segment, but of multiple segments. And it was a maternal effect. So if you take homozygous females, cross them to heterozygous males, and then look at the homozygous, you could see 94.3% penetrance and quite high expressivity. And if you do the reciprocal cross, take homozygous males, cross them to heterozygous females, then you only get 53% penetrance and much lower expressivity. So I, I was you know, delighted I'd found exactly what I was expecting to find. And then I also, it, this mutant also turns out to be temperature sensitive. And when I did these temperature shifts, I found that the temperature sensitive period was around about the blastoderm stage, which is when the, the Drosophila embryo cellularizes and when there was various lines of evidence already uh, when cells are thought to be specified. So the whole thing looked as if it fitted with this idea of uh, a gradient of an activator 
uh, which would activate uh, the different homeotic genes predicted. And of course, remember, Ed Lewis predicted an individual gene for each segment at this point. This was before the discovery of ABDA and ABDB, that each gene would be activated by different levels of this, of this morphogen encoded by trithorax. There's another interesting link here to Waddington, incidentally, because, of course, Waddington, 25 years earlier, had been doing these experiments of looking at assimilation, where he'd been doing selection experiments, um, treating uh, flies with ether, or treating embryos with ether. This is this curious phenomenon of ether phenocopping, whereby if you expose uh, blastoderm stage embryos to ether vapor, then in a proportion of the adults which grow up from those, uh, those uh, exposed embryos, you will find bithorax-like um, phenotypes. And so he'd, done, he'd been studying this and tried to understand uh, if, if you could find a genetic basis for uh, at this acquired characteristic and <laughs> kept selecting uh, the, the, the flies which had the strongest phenotypes until eventually he, he'd selected lines which would produce a phenotype independent of the ether vapor. And, um, it, and it, he actually, he then in this paper went on to map these loci and found that the, um, the third chromosome had a particularly strong effect, and trithorax is located on the third chromosome, so I think it's very likely that he isolated alleles of trithorax in this experiment. And I then, and of course, Jimmy, having worked with Waddington, knew about all of this. He knew these experiments inside out, so he suggested I expose these flies to, to ether vapor, and sure enough, I found that they were highly sensitive to ether vapor, so that if you took, um, heterozygotes from homozygous females and expose them to ether, then a <coughs> very high proportion of them would show phenotypes, uh, whereas the reciprocal cross gave lower, but still an enhanced uh, exp uh, expression. So this was exciting times, and, and, and at that time, the, the really, in Europe, the center of Drosophila development was Madrid, and Antonio Garcia Belido was working on um, similar things, and in fact, it turned out that he was working on a mutation called regulator of bithorax, which Ed Lewis had isolated, uh, a lethal mutation, and, and, and sent it to Antonio, and Antonio was, was, was analyzing this. And uh, in writing to Antonio, we came to the conclusion that these two mutants might be allelic. So I went over to Madrid in 1979 with another former uh, Waddington Medal winner, Michael Aikham, seen here. This is outside the Residencia de Estudiantes, which is where people like Picasso and Bunuel used to hang out in the 1930s, so it's actually quite exciting staying there. And this is Hines Morata driving the, the Citroen. And then here, this mass of hair is actually Steve Kerridge, who some of you might know. So that was a very exciting period. You can imagine, if those of you who know Antonio, having what he called bithorax colloquia every afternoon, which sort of started at lunchtime and went on till about seven o'clock. And, um, and so he, and he was absolutely convinced by this model that um, regulator bithorax trithorax was acting as the activator in the blastoderm embryo. But then I went and did some, some more experiments and did some clonal analysis. And of course, this was, this was the most powerful tool in Drosophila development at the time, and still is a very powerful tool. It's really the only, the only organism where you can do this easily, which is inactivate a gene at any particular stage by making, in a, in, by making genetic mosaics, um, <coughs> which in those days we did by radiation. And doing these experiments, I showed that actually trithorax is required in all of these tissues. So you remove it from anywhere, in the head, so in the antenna, in the eye, in the halter, even in the genitalia. Removing it will transform those structures into mesothoracic structures. So that told us that actually trithorax is required continuously throughout proliferation to maintain the determined state of those cells. And of course, that is now the accepted model of trithorax group proteins, which have been found in all uh, animals, and it's, and it's thought that MLL1, which is the, the human, one of the human trithorax proteins, actually acts as a mark on condensed chromosome during mitosis so that it maintains the determined state of, of genes and, 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 and the, the, the genome remembers which, which genes to reactivate after cell division. So, of course, we were pretty excited about this, and I wrote up a paper which we submitted to Nature and this was my first rejection from Nature in 1979. Referee 1, which was written, of course, in those days, people wrote their, they used a typewriter 
to write their references, and, and the, the Madrid typewriter had this very characteristic typeface, <laughs> <laughs> which I've not been able to reproduce here, but it said, very interesting, publish. Referee two was less convinced. He or she said that it was interesting, but the world can wait for trithorax, was the, was the, um, the final decision. So um, instead, it was published in Molecular Genetics in 1980. But actually, that turned out to be a stroke of luck as well, because the corresponding editor of Molecular General Genetics who handled this paper was none other than Walter Goering. And at that time, Walter Goering chaired the selection committee for the EMBO Drosophila Development Workshop, which is held every two years in Crete. Now, those of you in the Drosophila world will know these days, in order to actually you know, to have a chance of going there, you have to have about five cell papers and you have to submit a huge application, your CV, research proposals and so forth, and even then you're unlikely to get accepted. Me, as a naive, naive PhD student, wrote to Walter Goering and said, I'd like to come to this meeting, and he happened to be handling this paper at the time, so he, um, he invited me to, 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 uh, to go there. And this is where it was held. Actually, I only took this photograph a few years ago, but it hasn't really changed very much since, since the 1970s, 80s, at the Orthodox Academy in Kalimbari. And this was also a transformative experience for me for several reasons. First of all, it was the first time I gave a, a talk in public, actually. And I, w I went there not expecting to have to speak, so I didn't have any slides. Those days you had to have slides. Didn't have any slides, but I was, I was talked into giving a talk by, by Welcome Bender, actually who also had heard about trithorax and thought it was interesting. So I got up and gave you know, this awful, I think it was, it was a terrible experience. And I do remember a, a certain French geneticist who will remain nameless coming up to me afterwards and saying, I'm sorry, but that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I know most of my French colleagues can guess who it was. Uh, but the reason that the most that was the that was the sort of downside of the meeting. But the but the upside of it was that I met these two people for the first time, Janina Stein Volhard and Eric Vieschhaus. And at this meeting, nearly all of the talks were about um, either the heat shock loci, or copia transposable elements. And so there were endless restriction maps being shown. And and I was sort of writing, trying to write down all these because I didn't actually know what a restriction map was at that time. And then Eric get, got up and gave this amazing talk about all of these mutants they'd found. And that was just, that was, again, that was another uh, eureka moment for me. <coughs> and, and, and at that point, I, I, I realized that this was what I wanted to work on next. But again, I didn't do the obvious thing and, and write to Eric and Yanni. Um, I, I, f I went to work instead with Pat Simpson in Strasbourg. And um, Strasbourg is a lovely place. This is very close to where I used to live, so I used to walk through Petit France every day to get to the lab, because in those days the lab was in the centre of town, not out in Ilkirch, where many of you may, may know now. Uh, this was Chambon's Institute. Another great thing was that my lab mate was Norbert Perimon, who some of you may know, and working with Norbert was certainly quite an experience. And, um, and I also got to become part of what was known as the Drosophila Mafia, um, and so this was in 1982 up in the Alps, so here's Antonio, here's Yanni, and really this was pretty much the Drosophila developmental genetics community in Europe at the time. I mean, there were a few outliers, I mean, Robert Whittle being one of them, Robert and Jimmy didn't get invited to this. They ha I think Robert had been invited to it once, but he, he wasn't asked back for some reason. <laughs> um, so it was a, as you can see, it was a pretty small community, but it was pretty exciting to be with this bunch of people. Nevertheless, I decided that living, in, living and working in France wasn't for me, and so I started to look for um, an escape route, I suppose. And one day I saw an advertisement in the back of Nature. Um, and again, this is interesting, because I, you know, I always say I wouldn't advertise for postdocs. I just like to take people who apply to me. But in fact, I... I I responded to this advertisement. And the advertisement was, put, was placed by David Ish, Horowitz, again, another former Waddington medal winner. And David was, at the time, this, is, this photograph is more recent, but he was probably only in his early 30s at the time, and he was one of a group of young scientists that had been recruited to the ICRF Mill Hill Laboratories by John Cairns, who was very far-sighted and could see the relevance of developmental biology 
to cancer research then. This was back in the mid-1970s. So he'd assembled this great group of people, Bridget Hogan, Jeff Williams, Waddington Medal winner, Jonathan Snack, Waddington Medal winner, and David Ish, um, and also Thomas Lindahl as well, who went on to become the head of the unit. So this was a really, so that one, just going to um, have an interview with David was quite an exhilarating experience, and I decided immediately that I wanted to return to the UK, having gone to Strasbourg, expecting to live the rest of my life in France, actually. So I joined the lab and worked with these two great people. So here's the lab in Burton Hole Lane. Some of you might know this. This became some sort of MRC tech transfer unit, which is sort of ironic. You know, it went from being a great, <laughs> a great center of basic research into a tech transfer unit. Um, and we, lit, we worked in incredibly cramped conditions, actually. This was the fly lab, and three of us worked in here. And this was the molecular biology lab, and Chris Rushlow shown here, who spent about three years of her postdoc sequencing um, the hairy gene. And Ken Howard here was the, the um, graduate student who was really a whiz at molecular biology, but also learned Drosophila genetics whilst there. So the project was to clone one of the peril genes that Eric had talked about at Crete just 18 months earlier. And David had chosen this one, called, which was called Barrel originally, because um, Eric and Yanni had mapped it and found that it was actually allelic to hairy. And hairy is a classic mutant which is adult viable, causes lots of hairs all over the place, including on the wing. And so this provided an easy way of, of, of screening for alleles by P element insertion, which then allowed us to clone it by transposon tagging. And that's exactly what David, uh, David and Sheena Pynchon did. And I'm sure David talked about that when he gave his Waddington Medal lecture. So, so the key thing that, um, that Ken and I did really was to, was to develop this method of, of um, RNA in situ. And in fact, we were working on this when this set of papers came out in 1984 describing the expression patterns of the homo homeotic genes and of FUTs. So this was the first peril gene to be shown to be expressed in stripes. So we were slightly disappointed about this, of course, because we were hoping to be the first to, to do these types of experiments. But we were also rather unimpressed by the quality of the in situ. So we decided that we needed to improve the quality. And just note that this, you know, this was a three-week exposure. So this was a NIC translated probe that they used in these experiments, three-week exposure. And even then, you know, three weeks was pretty short. I think Tom Kornberg's original experiments with Grail, they were three-month exposures. So those of you who are, who are used to doing in situ, you know, developing your in situ for a couple of hours, <laughs> It's worth bearing in mind that this was a whole different scale of things doing these experiments. So anyway, we adopted the newly uh, developed, um, made use of the SP6 polymerase to make single-stranded RNA probes and got these results, three days exposure. And the other key thing here was, was instead of using frozen sections, which is what Huff and, and colleagues in Walter Goering's lab had done, I used wax sections. And again, here, this is another lesson about being naive about things, because I was taking the embryos, putting them through, um, I don't know, I can't, xylene, and then putting them into wax at 60 degrees. And my colleagues, um, who were all ace molecular biologists, particularly Andy Flavel, who some of you may know, sort of fell about laughing. And they, I said, what's the matter? He said, they said, do you, you know, do you seriously expect there's going to be any messenger RNA left in those embryos after you've done all of those treatments to them? But I went ahead, and um, it worked. So, so we were quite pleased with this. So having developed this technique for um, and, and tested it with FUTs, we were then very eager to try it, you know, to do our in situ with Harry. At this point, I have to say, I'd been working pretty much flat out, and I decided I needed to go away. And I went off to Morocco for a week, having done the in situ, dipped the slides, and put them to expose. And Ken said, you know, he couldn't possibly wait until I got back. So we came to an agreement that he could, he could develop one slide whilst I was away, and only, but only if he let me know the results. Now, again, in those days in Morocco in 1984, it was not, you know, there was no internet. You couldn't, there was, it was very difficult to make phone calls. So the only way he could communicate me was by a method called Telex, which many of you probably have never heard of. But anyway, one day when I came back to the hotel from the beach, 
the receptionist very suspicious, looked at me very suspiciously and gave me, <laughs> gave me this thin strip of paper on which was this message. <laughs> so, of course, I was very excited to get back, and we left the other slides to, um, to develop a bit longer, to expose a bit longer, and this, this was the result. And that formed the basis of this paper, which we published in 1985. One of the important things about, about using wax was it enabled us to, to make sequential, take, take sequential sections and put them onto different slides, which we could then hybridize with different probes so we could actually do two-way or three-way comparisons of gene expression in the same embryo, which I think was, you know, was quite a technical development. And so then we started rattling through all sorts of mutants, and I'm not going to go through the details, but this was an example uh, where we looked at the patterns of expression of hairy futs and of, the, and of UBX um, in wild-type embryos and in crupal embryos on the gap genes, and this was the first demonstration of how the gap genes effect, regulate the peril genes and also the homeotic genes. This paper was published in 1986, and, and I, sh I should say at this point I'd forgotten to mention that um, my lessons in histology came from a young uh, Professor Jim Smith, shown here, another future Waddington medal winner, uh, shown here enjoying a, only a half pint, I think, in 1982. But, um, but Jim did enjoy the odd drink. And there was a, there was a pub across the road from the lab in Mill Hill called the Adam and Eve. And I know that um, one day, one lunchtime, Jim had been over for lunch, had a few drinks probably, came back to the lab and decided he needed to go down to the dark room where all of my carefully collected... Uh, sections of crupal mutant embryos were, 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 had been coated in emulsion and were drying and uh, walked into the dark room and turned the light on. <laughs> so actually this paper should have been published in 1985. <laughs> 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 so, um, and then this was, an, this was an experiment which I was, or, or a set of experiments, a set of experiments which I was particularly uh, proud of actually because this, this was this was really the first analysis of the, of the regulatory elements of the peril genes. So subsequently, there's been lots of molecular characterization of the, the cis-acting elements. But this was all based on genetics. So in, in addition to doing P-element mutation, mutagenesis and EMS mutagenesis for hairy alleles, I also did some X-ray mutagenesis, which of course in, 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 induces rearrangements, and found a series of alleles which cause these different phenotypes, so this whole phenotypic set, which um, <coughs> some of which lacked only a few segments and then eventually got to this, this null phenotype here. And when we looked at the expression pattern of hairy in these, we found that, they, the, that these embryos lacked specific sets of stripes. And then when we, when we mapped the rearrangements, we found that they, they, they lay in different, the, the breakpoints lay in different different regions of the upstream, of, of the, of the, sorry, the upstream five prime region of the gene, implying that they were uh, breaking, that the breaks were, were removing specific regulatory elements for specific stripes. So really this was the first demonstration that of this, of this um, type of organization of the promoter which uh, identified elements which are regulated by different uh, gap, gap genes. And then the third paper, which Ken and I published, um, based, again, using this technique, and we really hammered this, this technique for several years, was looking now at the role of the peril genes in regulating the genes which act downstream of the peril genes, which is the segment polarity genes. And this time, at this time, the only segment polarity gene which had been cloned, for which there was a probe available, was engrailed. And the, this paper really just showed that, that both hairy and FUTs regulate the activation of uh, engrailed in, in alternate stripes. So at this point, my tenure at, um, in David's lab had come to an end. In fact, I was on the dole for three months because in the 1980s you could claim unemployment benefit between, between jobs. And then I moved um, almost unexpectedly, actually. I was, just, I was in the lab one day and Peter Lawrence called me up and said, I've got you a job at the LMB. Do you want it? <laughs> so... <laughs> So I said, well, um, yes, okay. So I went to the LMB, but I didn't stay there for very long, as I'll explain in a moment. But I spent most of 1986 in the LMB, where 
I had a very fruitful, in, in fact, I should have said this interaction with Alfonso started several years earlier, so that almost the whole time I was in Mill Hill, uh, Alfonso and I were, were talking together, and it was uh, really a very stimulating and exciting time. But now, so now we were actually in the same place in this tiny little lab which we shared um, on the, I can't remember which floor now, but it doesn't matter, but it's certainly in the cell biology division. And this was our friend Carlos Cabrera, who um, was working on Scoot at the time. Carlos sadly died quite a long time ago now. Um, but we, we certainly had a lot of fun uh, working in, in, in this lab. And, and I spent most of my time there doing in situ, actually, including for Carlos. And I remember Carlos asking me to do some Scoot in situ one weekend because he knew I was coming in on the Saturday. And he, he said, I'll leave the probes in the fridge for you. So I went in Saturday morning, opened the, opened the fridge, and there was, a, there was a, a rack of Eppendorf tubes, and on it was a big piece of paper saying, do not fuck up. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but our main project now was looking at the segment polarity genes. So the segment polarity mutants were the third class of, of segmentation mutants that Eric and Yanni had found. And these were, were, these were intriguing because they didn't cause uh, a loss of... of a, a reduction in segment number, but they, but they disrupt the patterning of the segments. So we thought these were going to be very important in, in elaborating the pattern of, of the developing larva. And the first paper we published together from, from this time was um, really building on the work that Ken and I had done, but now looking, by this time, Nick Baker, who was Peter Lawrence's student, had cloned wingless, so we were now able to look at wingless as well as engrailed expression in these mutants. So first of all, we looked at how they were regulated by peril genes, which is shown here. But then the big question was, once, since the peril genes are only expressed transiently and they're only, probably only functioning at the velocidome stage, how are these domains of expression maintained? And so we did this big survey of wingless and expression in the segment polarity mutants. And I'm not going to go through all of those data, you'll be pleased to know, but, um, and, and many of you will know this anyway. Um, but one of the things we found was that <clears throat> there was this mutual dependence of wingless and engrailed on each other. And so this gave rise to this idea that, the that the, these expression domains at the compartment boundary were maintained by these, by these mutual uh, interactions between these two genes. But we didn't know at this point how these interactions were mediated. But the clue to how this interaction was mediated came very quickly because at the same, almost at the same time, um, Rule Nuss's lab had shown that INT1, which, was no, which, uh, the, which is a on proto-oncogene which, which, no, which is known to encode a secreted protein, is actually the ortholog of wingless, uh, or the mammalian ortholog of, of wingless. So that then uh, gave a candidate for one of these question marks that wingless itself could be the signal which was signaling back to engrailed, but it still left open the question as to what was signaling from engrailed to wingless. Uh, but one of, the, one of the other mutants that we'd looked at in this big survey was, was, was the mutant Patched, which, which I found particularly, well, we both found particularly intriguing, because Patched had this unusual effect of expanding the wingless domain and also causing these ectopic, the ectopic induction of engrailed uh, next to these expanded wingless domains. And so sort of Alfonso and I decided at this point, we, so Alfonso, we'd also looked at Naked, which had a similar... Um, effect on engrailed expression in wingless. So we decided that Alfonso would take naked. I'm correct, aren't I? Alfonso's nodding, yes. <laughs> Alfonso would take naked and I would take patched. And so um, <clears throat> I was then trying to think how, to, how we were going to clone patch because positional cloning in those days was actually quite tedious. And I, was really, I really wanted to get on with this. And I was, again, this was another example of incredible luck. So I was sitting there one night at home um, thinking about this, and the phone went, and it was Robert Whittle. And I only spoke to Robert Whittle maybe, you know, when I came to BSDB meetings, maybe once a year. So it's quite unusual for him to phone me. And he said, you remember that mutant that I was working on when you first joined my lab? So there were two, actually. There was Costal, but there was also one called Tufted. And I said, yes. And he said, well, and, and he'd made, he'd, 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 tufted one was, was a viable allele, but he'd done a screen and isolated a lethal allele, which gave this very strong phenotype over tufted one shown here. And he said, I made some cuticle preps from it. And then he described the phenotype, and the phenotype was this, which was the patch phenotype. I could tell just from his description over the phone it must be patched. 
So that then allowed us to, and this is the breeding scheme that Robert then wrote out and sent to me, and this allowed us to use the same approach that David had used for Harry to isolate transposon-induced mutants of, of tufted or of patched um, to clone it. So at this point, I had decided to leave the LMB and moved back to the ICRF and into this new developmental biology unit, which was on the top floor of the zoology psychology building in Oxford. And, um, and actually, I took this photograph just a couple of years ago when I visited Peter Holland, who um, showed me round, and it was like the Mary Celeste, wasn't it? We, just, we did find Chris Grahams in the corner of the lab, <laughs> but otherwise the place was completely empty. <laughs> And, um, and it was really just untouched. In fact, my lab was called the Molecular Embryology Lab, and, and right outside my door I had the sign saying Molecular Embryology Lab, and it was still there, except someone had turned it into the Molecular Evolutionary Lab. <laughs> so as, as, as Liz said, you know, another great thing about the DBU was the... Um, the, the football team, I've got a different, different photograph here. I didn't realize that other one existed, actually. Um, this was all the rage in those days, hot pants. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Richard in his 1940s shorts, I guess. Yes. And Rosa here. Yep. Ilan Davis, David Ish, Alethea Hidalgo, my first graduate student. And so, uh, so I put together my team, which basically was Alethea and Isabel Guerrero. We didn't always dress like this, incidentally. This was for the official opening of the unit. And we cloned Patched, or Isabel and Alethea, I should say, really cloned Patched. I did the, the in situs again, the chromosome in situs this time. And, um, and this was a bit of a surprise when we sequenced it. So Yoshi Nakano, who came to the lab later, actually sequenced it. And we found that it encoded this uh, multipass transmembrane protein which, of course, at the time, you know, nobody, I mean, all of the important developmental genes were either secreted proteins, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, or, or transcription factors. So this was a complete puzzle. And in fact, one of the reviewers of the Nature paper was very skeptical about it and said that you know, it probably wasn't important. But on this occasion, I managed to, I'd, by this time, I'd learned how to persuade <laughs> editors of Nature <laughs> to discount uh, negative reviewers. So it did get published. <laughs> but then it was, so, 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 so we, we spent some time trying to think about what this meant and what, what, what this type of protein could be doing. And I guess then the key was, by this stage, it was becoming clear that hedgehog was um, a signaling molecule. And in fact, a paper in 1988, so predating the cloning of Patch by Jim Mola, had done this very nice analysis, of, again, of clonal analysis. And he presented data showing that hedgehog acted non-autonomously, which implied that it could be acting as a signal. And then in addition to that, Alethea Hidalgo and I had done these experiments, really following up the work that we'd done with Alfonso, I'd done with Alfonso, showing that hedgehog was absolutely required for the expression of wingless. And so the, it became attractive to think that hedgehog was the signal signaling from the engrailed cells to the wingless cells. And on the basis of that and some epistasis analysis, we put forward the idea that, hed that patched was actually the receptor for hedgehog. Again, counterintuitive, and it ran against what everybody believed at the time, that si signals bind to receptors and activate them, whereas this model proposed that the signal bound to the receptor and inactivated it. So we said we suggest that patch protein may itself be the receptor for this signal implying this is an unusual mechanism of ligand-dependent reception and activation. So again, that got into nature, but there was a lot of skepticism about it. Anyway, we went on to um, then use the same sort of approach of, 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 of in situ in mutants to look at the other, to identify the other components of the pathway. And this brought us back to Costal II, that mutant which Robert had been working on back in the 1970s, which I dismissed as being uninteresting, but by this time, Pat Simpson, actually, my former postdoc mentor, had done some experiments suggesting it might be, that it's showing that it had a phenotype similar to Patch. So then we looked at the molecular level. Um, you have to remove the maternal expression of Costal II to see this effect, and sure enough, in maternal zygotic mutants, uh, we saw this activation of wingless, which is very similar to that of Patch, uh, seen in Patch. And then the, the um, but this, 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 suggested Costal II acts as a, as a negative regulator of the pathway, and then mutants of both fused and cubitus interruptus, we showed, uh, actually phenocopy, essentially phenocopy 
hedgehog in that they're required, these two genes are required for wingless expression. So on the basis of that, we propose this model of the hedgehog signal transduction pathway, um, which was published in 1993. And really, this is pretty much the core pathway. There's just one component missing, which I'll come to in a few moments. So Liz mentioned that um, I had actually, by this stage, been convinced by Yanni that I should drop Drosophila and start working on zebrafish. And she did this in typically impressive fashion. In fact, drove me from Tübingen to Stuttgart, um, which is about 20 miles, I think in third gear, I don't think she ever changed into fourth, <laughs> to a pet shop to show me zebrafish, because <laughs> she didn't have any in the lab at the time. And uh, so I'd already, in fact, actually, I should, just sorry, I know we're running out of time, but I did want to point out there was the fish tank. So this was how our zebrafish work began. This was the fish tank in the, in the, in the lab. And um, I think when the ICRF offered me this job and I said I wanted to work on fish, they thought it was just a whim. So they, they basically allowed me to buy a fish tank, but I was, I, I had bigger plans. And actually, I must say, I, I'd like to thank Chris Graham because Chris was incredibly helpful in finding space for me and, and found an old aquarium in the, in the zoology department, which he allowed me to, check, to, tr to uh, transform into a, a zebrafish aquarium. So this was, again, another amazing occasion. The Ringbergs, I've called it the Ringberg strategy meeting, and I think Jim showed this photograph last year when he gave his Waddington Medal talk. But this was a, so this was a gathering of, of the, uh, the great and the good in, in vertebrate development uh, organized by Yanni, the idea being that we should all get together and talk about what we should be doing with the zebrafish. So she brought in <coughs> Xenopus experts, John Gurdon, Jim somewhere, Jim down here, I'm not going to go through everybody. Um, Chuck Kimmel, who was really the person who had kept the fish going. Oh, John Gerhardt, I should have mentioned too. Chuck Kimmel, who had really kept the fish going after George Freisinger's death in the States. And then a whole bunch of um, Lewis Wolford here, a whole bunch of other people. And this was a, a very stimulating meeting um, at which, amongst other things, we managed to find time to write um, a rap. So Yanni always likes to be entertained. And she likes music, and we wrote this rap, which we performed. Um, we being Jim, myself, Pascal Hafter, Maria Leptin, uh, Andy McMahon, uh, and Bernard Herman. And um, it was a great success. And even at this early stage, Jim was already showing his leadership qualities, as you can see, out at the front. Um, <laughs> And uh, I do remember afterwards, Yanni was quite impressed by this, and she, sa she said, you know, she said, when did you find time to write all of these lyrics? Because it went on and it went on and on and on, didn't it? <laughs> and Jim said, well, actually, he said, what we did, Yanni, was we went back to Phil's room last night and wrote them. And, um, but then he, she, he, he said, you know, eventually we had to leave. Phil kicked us out because he had to prepare his talk. And Yanni looked at me and she said, you should have kicked them out earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, this is where I first really got to know Andy McMahon. And Andy at that time was working on wingless, or went one and engrailed, in, in the mouse. And he had, amongst other things, uh, this was work, work which he was doing with David Wilkinson at Mill Hill. And they'd shown this interesting relationship between the domains of went one and engrailed in the, in the brain. And slightly later, Laura Ballyqueef had been doing these uh, embryological uh, manipulations, transplanting bits of the midbrain hindbrain boundary into the diencephalon, <laughs> and showing that this resulted in the induction of engrails. So we had this idea that there may be some relationship between wingless and engrailed in the mammalian brain, which mirrored the relationship between wingless and engrailed in, at the compartment boundary. And so on the basis of, of this rather thin evidence, I suppose, we put together this um, <coughs> Human Frontiers of Science program proposal. Uh, which was awarded in 1993. And note, it's in the neuroscience research grants because we thought we were, we were looking for uh, mechanisms mediating this interaction. And as well as proposing to study the interaction between wing, wind one and engrailed, we also proposed to look for orthologs of hedgehog, which we speculated might be expressed in the engrailed domain and would reciprocally regulate wind one expression. So very naive, but it got through the reviewers. And we added Cliff Tabin to this proposal because Cliff... We'd, 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 I'd met Cliff for the first time at the Ringberg meeting, and he was also interested in, in, in looking for 
vertebrate orthologs of fly genes. And this was the meeting that we had in March 1993 on the balcony outside my lab in Oxford, which was about three times as big as my lab. And things moved incredibly quickly. And actually, Andy's lab cloned um, the first vertebrate ortholog of hedgehog, which turned out to be the gene called desert hedgehog. And rather disappointingly, he couldn't see, by in situ, they couldn't see any expression of desert hedgehog in the embryo. So they sort of put it to one side, but they sent it to us anyway. And my postdoc, um, Stefan Krauss, used this to screen the zebrafish library and pulled out um, <clears throat> a full-length clone for a gene which we originally called hedgehog C that then became known as sonic hedgehog. And of course, this is the, the well-known pattern of expression of sonic hedgehog. In those days, taking these photographs was not trivial. In fact, I, I, I took these photographs and developed them myself, you know, doing color, color prints and everything, so which was, you had to get the temperature just right and so forth. This was for the paper. So, but, but, but when, we, when Stefan first did the in situ, we obviously wanted to communicate the result to Andy and Cliff, and he actually did these beautiful drawings, which I only found fairly recently in my archives when I was cleaning out my drawers in Sheffield. And, um, and, and you can see there's a the little stamp that you get when you send, a, send something through a fax machine. So he faxed this over to, to um, Harvard for Andy and Cliff. And of course, then things moved incredibly rapidly. Interestingly, as a little aside, I, just, I thought it was interesting that around this time, well, a few months earlier, uh, Alethea and I had published another paper on the regulation, we call it the regulation of transcription as Jean-Paul Vanson pointed out to me, in the Drossosoph. <laughs> it's, a, it's a subspecies of... <laughs> um, and here we said wingless expression could be maintained in just those cells that are within range of the putative hedgehog signal, a range that from our observation seems to be limited to adjacent cells. And in the very same issue of development was a paper from Marisha Platchek about uh, induction of floor plate differentiation by contact-dependent homo homeogenetic signals, in which they say that the, the taken together, these observations suggest that in vivo contact between the notochord and neural plate is required to initiate floor plate differentiation. So, these, so I thought it was ironic that these two papers were actually in the same edition of, of development just before we cloned Sonic. Of course, once we cloned Sonic and saw where it was expressed, I really had this idea fixed in my head that hedgehog was a very short-range signal. And so it seemed like a, 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 an obvious candidate for the floor plate inducer, which Marisha had, had described with Tom Jessel and Jane Dodd. <clears throat> and Andy and I both did experiments to test that by overexpressing Sonic, either in the mouse or in the fish, and showing that that would cause the expression of ventral markers in, in the dorsal brain. Um, and this made the front cover of Cell, but of course, you will all recognize that this is neither a mouse nor a fish embryo. And of course, the really big story was its role as the uh, ZPA molecule from Cliff's lab. And that was subsequently shown to have this remarkable homology with the role of hedgehog in the Drosophila appendages, in particular the wing. So this resulted in um, the biggest interest I've ever had in any science I've ever done. So there was a feature on it in the New York Times in which I made some statements I'd rather <laughs> not have made, which I, uh, I won't underline here. But the other thing that we did was file a patent. And again, this was not an obvious thing to do um, in those days. But, and we really only did it because Cliff's father was a patent attorney and Cliff told his dad about the findings and Cliff's dad said, you should file a patent to protect this. So we did. And the patent said, da, 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 um, for example, to generate and or maintain an array of different vertebrate tissues, both in vitro and in vivo. So in other words, you know, the, patent, the, what, the invention we were protecting here was a, 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 a method of directing the differentiation of, of cells, and, um, which could be used in regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine was a term which had only just been coined. And this IP then provided the foundation for a new biotech startup called Ontogeny Incorporated, which later merged to form another company called Curis. As an aside, I just wanted to point out here that I recently came across this report on regenerative medicine, the patent landscape in 2011 from the Intellectual Property Office here in the UK. And I looked, for, looked, looked through it and found absolutely no mention of that patent or the 13 other US patents <laughs> that we subsequently filed and had approved in the US, all of which relate to the use of hedgehog 
in, re in regenerative medicine uses. What this, what this report does tell you a lot about are patterns uh, dealing with ES uh, with stem cells. And I think there's an important lesson here, which is these are the people, these are the type of reports upon which funding policy is made. And unless we actually make it clear that developmental biology has you know, important biomedical applications, then we won't get support in the future. So I actually, I've actually written to the patent office and pointed this out to them, and they've admitted that they, they use far too narrow search terms, and they're about, to re they're about to revise this report, and have asked me for input into it. So I think when you read the 2014 report, you might find some sonic hedgehog patents in there. <coughs> anyway, I know I'm running out of time. So now, this, by this time, I'd moved my lab to Lincoln's in Fields, and I, I, always re I always regard this as the sort of golden age of my lab, actually, when I had a fantastic group of people, not all shown here, but including Michael Feetz, Marcel van den Heuvel, Kate Lewis, and Cyril Alexandra. And of course, we were led by our great director, Paul Nurse. He looks rather like Stephen Gerrard after he'd scored a penalty, I think. <laughs> so, Cyril did this very nice piece of work showing that CI is the transcription factor that mediates hedgehog signaling, which up until that point had not been generally accepted. There were various theories about how CI might work, and that was important because he defined the, also defined the upstream uh, regulatory elements attached to which CI binds, and this provided um, the basis of an in vitro assay for hedgehog um, activity, which I'll mention in a moment. Marcel cloned the um, smoothened gene and showed that it encodes this um, G protein coupled receptor like protein, which really was the missing link then in the hedgehog pathway. And at the same time, there were key findings from other groups. One of them, of course, probably the most important, was this discovery that patched is mutated in patients with Gorlin syndrome or basal nevoid syndrome. And this discovery was made, first of all, by um, a <coughs> human gene cloning consortium, gene mapping consortium, uh, led by Brandon Wainwright and Alan Bale, and contemporaneously by Matt Scott, who had also cloned patched uh, independently of us, in parallel with us, and, and had gone on to clone the vertebrate patched orthologs. And I think, again, this is interesting to reflect that had this gene been, had only this group identified this, this gene um, through this, this human gene mapping, and, and we hadn't known about the role of patched in hedgehog signaling, it might have taken quite a while to figure out um, what the significance of this was. Another key finding at this time, of course, was Phil Beachy's discovery that cyclopamine um, can acts as, acts as a teratogen which inhibits um, the, the hedgehog pathway, and which they went on later to show works by binding directly to smoothened. And then, of course, mutations in smoothened were then activating mutations in smoothened were shown to also to be associated with basal cell carcinoma. So all of these findings suddenly gave a new significance to the IP and the company that we set up, because now hedgehog became a, the hedgehog pathway became a prime candidate for developing anti-cancer therapies. And really, ontogeny went into full gear then, uh, d d screening for novel small molecules using a Glee rep the Glee reporter assay, which was really based on that finding that Glee is the transcription factor that mediates hedgehog signaling. And um, it's soon after these screens began, as I said, merged to form Curis. And then in 2000, I think, Curis or 2001, Curis published the first paper describing small molecule modulators of hedgehog signaling. So then leaping forward a few years, these went into clinical trials. Um, more, uh, <coughs> more potent versions of these molecules went into clinical trials and, and they gave spectacular results in the treatment of patients with metastatic basal cell carcinoma. And um, in 2012, the FDA approved the use of Vismodigib, which is the brand name of which is Eriveg, uh, for use in the treatment of patients with metastatic basal cell carcinoma. And um, I think last year, the British Pharmacological Society named Vismodigib Drug Discovery of the Year. And it's interesting that Rick Graham, who led the Genentech team, we are very proud that our understanding of the hedgehog signaling pathway enabled us to develop a medicine which today is providing meaningful benefit 
to patients with advanced basal cell carcinoma. And I would just like to remind, <laughs> submit that you know, a lot of that understanding has come from the work of Drosophila geneticists. And I think that's a vindication of um, the support that my lab got and other labs have got from funding agencies. I mean, the ICRF funded me to do all of this work without having any clear idea where it was going. But in fact, um, bismodigib is, is, I think I'm right in saying, is one of only three drugs which have come out of uh, research funded by the ICRF over its 100-year history. So really, there's a very strong case for doing basic research and continuing to do basic research. I'd like to finish just by pointing out, so everything I've talked about so far was done before 2000. I just wanted to point out that my lab is still active. <laughs> the hedgehog signaling vert invertebrates is a continuing puzzle. And just, just a quick vignette of some of our most recently published work, which I think bring, is quite nice because it's, it sort of brings me back to the beginning of my talk. Uh, and this was our, and of course now it's possible in zebrafish to use gene, to, to, to use targeted mutagenesis. We did this with zinc fingers, which are now passe, and people use tailings, which are passe, and everyone uses CRISPR. But, you know, this is, this is work from a year ago. So, <laughs> so we made mutants in, in, in KIF-7, Kif which is the vertebrate costal 2, which Robert had been working on all those years ago and found that the homozygotes are pretty much without phenotypes. There's a slight phenotype here, but, they, but they're, they're viable and fertile. But then when we cross the homozygous females to heterozygous males, we get uh, this strong maternal zygotic phenotype. So KIF7 is actually a true maternal effect mutation, just like trithorax that I discovered back in the 70s. So on that note, my hour is up. Sorry to keep you from the bar. I'd just like to, I've mentioned some of the people. These are, these are the people that worked in my lab on these projects over the years in the UK from 86 to 2006. And I'd like to thank all of them for their tremendous efforts and insights and input. And of course, I've mentioned Robert Whittle and his enormous influence that he had on me as, as in my view, the ideal PhD mentor. You know, he gave me advice, but he just let me do what I wanted to do, but he was always there to help when I, when I needed it. And of course, we had, I've had fantastic collaborations with Andy McMahon and Cliff Tabin. So I'd like to thank you um, for listening and staying awake. If you didn't stay awake, you can read, <laughs> read this story in this fantastic book written by Kathy Weston. And actually, Kathy has brought 10 free copies, has it? 20. So the first 20 people down here, when I finish speaking, can get a copy of this book signed by Kathy. Yeah. And the final plug is just to remind you what Liz said at the outset, which is that the ISDB Congress will be held in Singapore in 2017. So I look forward to seeing you all there then. Thank you. <laughs>